Well, hello, hello, everybody. Hello, Criminella T. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Oh, I'm so glad to have you tonight. Very excited. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. I wanted to collab with you for a long time, but you're like so West Memphis three that I'm like, I feel like I would be like a dumb child in the classroom next to you. So, oh, no. I'm like, we have to go on like a neutral territory. <laughs> well, that's, um, it's funny you say that because I was talking to Dr. B the other day and I was like, I don't want people to think that I'm like a one trick pony, that all I can ever talk about or have not, all I know about is the West Memphis three, you know, because I know about lots of different cases and lots of different cases um, interest me. It's just the West Memphis three case is the very first case I ever studied, which is what then got me interested in other true crime cases. Like when I was actually uh, first researching the West Memphis three case, the, um, oh gosh, it was out in California. His last name starts with a W. Um, Dan and Danielle, uh, Van, oh gosh, what is her? I know you're going to know it, Teresa. It was like 2002, 2003. It's not ringing a bell yet. He, they, they, uh, he was their neighbor and, um, there was a lot of, there was a big, huge deal made in the trial about the parents smoking pot, but they think that he, um, killed her in the RV that was parked out in front of his house. I'm going to Google it out real quick. Okay, do it. Because it's yeah. it's Danielle Vaughn something, and I just can't remember the name. But um, I was uh, actually Court TV was covering that case um, when I uh, was Danielle Van Dam. Danielle Van Dam. Mm -hmm. Hold on, I'm going to pull it up. Okay, yeah, it doesn't ring a bell. She was an American girl from the Saber Springs neighborhood of San Diego, California, who disappeared from her bedroom during the night of February 1st through 2nd, 2002. Her body was found by searchers February 27th in a, a remote area. And it, what was his name? Hold How on. Old David, was she? she was, uh, hold on, let me look. She was, I think, well, I want to say like 10. 10 or something. Why does her age? So she was born in 1994 and this happened in 2002. Eight. 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 Yeah. David uh, Westerfield was who Westerfield was Westerfield sounds very familiar. Mm -hmm. we might sounds have, very familiar. We might have to go back and revisit that case. Yes. Steph M. Um, Danielle Van Dam. We, um, but that I was watching that trial as I was researching um, some of the stuff that was going on at that time in the West Memphis Three case. So I was super that that case I was very fascinated with. So <clears throat> we may have to revisit that case then. Yeah, so two thousand two. I'm trying to think of where I, what I was doing in two thousand two. I may not have been doing true crime as much at that time. I think I was at the bar a lot. I was a mom, so I had no choice. But yeah, I had, I had no kids yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in 2002, I, I had three. In 2002, I was like 23, so I was definitely probably at the bar a lot. I think I was right about that same age, but I was not at the bar. I was. I had three kiddos. Remember, Holy I, yeah. well, I had. I started when I was 18. Yeah, so. Yeah, I had my first, I was 20, wait, 27, and I turned 28 right after I had him, I think. Yeah, so. Yeah. So, yeah, I was like fascinated by that case and um, because there was a lot of forensics in it and um, it's starting to come back to me now. But I remember that um, there was some questions about whether it was really David uh, Westerfield or his son. And so, um, Westerfield sounds so familiar. Yeah. I, I know if I show you the picture, you're going to be like, I know exactly who that is. You're going to okay. remember it. You're going to remember it. So, Hey, truth and transparency. Thanks for coming to support. Let me say hi to everybody in the chat before we, yeah, no, I haven't said hi to anybody yet. Hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Dave G. Hi, Irish crime and coffee time. Momo Lupe Fuentes. Tony. 
Oh, well, Shamita, Steph M, Team Psych Ward. Who else? I said Navigator. Hey. Well, I think we should give him a little, like a, a brief backstory, because this is an older, not, okay, it's not West Memphis 3 old. Okay. <laughs> it's only two, <laughs> it happened in what, 2019? Yeah, I think that's when the conviction came down, right? I should pull yeah. up my I should pull up my paper. You think I'd actually know this stuff off the top of my head, but I well, don't. It, yeah, the it happened November tenth of twenty eighteen, and then he went to trial September of twenty nineteen. So, go ahead, you tell him what what this case is about, Teresa. Um, well, so I actually I, I watched a little bit of it when it was like what media wise, um, but I never watched the actual trial. And so um, last semester for one of my papers, I had to do. I had to do like a 15 page forensic re, you know, report on a, on a case trial. And so I actually picked, um, I think I've told you this, Jen, but mm -hmm. I picked the, the Chris Coleman case. Cause I, I am fascinated by that case and there's tons of for evident, like, you know, forensic evidence in that. So I was writing my paper on it for most of the semester. And then we had to turn in like a draft and have it approved. And so the professor comes back and he's like, yeah, he's all, this isn't going to work because the appeal was denied because the appeal had to be after 2018 even though he had appealed, his appeal was denied. So I was oh, like, you okay. flipping kidding me. So I had to basically start from scratch. And I was like, oh, another one I always wanted to watch was the Todd Bolas trial. So here I am, I, I'm pulling it up, you know, last minute, trying to, you know, throw a 15 page paper together for my forensics class. And uh, I watched the whole trial. I'm writing the paper and I realized um, there's, I, I don't like this case because there's hardly any forensic evidence. And it was a really bad case to try to do a paper on for forensic. I, you should have done West Memphis Surrey. No, no kidding. I should have, you know, in hindsight. But uh, so this case, the reason that I that I was fascinated to begin with was because people on social media were like, you know, back and forth on whether he was guilty or whether he was innocent. But I didn't know enough about it because I'd only actually watched just some regular stuff. So it's basically... A dad, I think he has three or four kids um, with his wife. The wife ends up dead on their farm and he ends up prosecuted. I don't want to give too much away. He yeah. ends up prosecuted for the murder um, and convicted of the murder. Yes. And so a lot of people on social media, like I was saying, they were like, three, it was three kids, Momo. Okay, thank you. Um, we're back and forth about whether he was guilty or not. So I watched the trial and then I, after I was done, I was like... I'm not sure how I feel about this guy's guilt. So then yeah. I brought it to you like, Hey, can we go over this trial? Cause I would love, we have, you know, we're very like-minded when it comes to some of the evidence pieces of trials. And so I was like, we need to like go over this and I want to see what you think. So that's why I said, I don't want to give too much away. Cause I want to see what the chat's opinion is and what your opinion is. And if you guys think that this guy was actually guilty or not. Okay. Sounds like a plan. So for me, of course, um, when, you brought it to me. I was uh, like, okay, I really want to do that, obviously. And, um, but I was in the middle of uh, the uh, chazzle dazzle. Chazzle dazzle. All the chazzle dazzle. And I was like, oh, I, 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 my compartments were too full up because I was, there is something I want to do with the West Memphis story. And it's like, tucked away in one of my back files and I, in the brain. And I was afraid that if I, if I started watching the trial, then um, I would get too many details confused. So I was like, okay, but then the jury in the chazel dazzles came back after uh, 37 minutes of deliberation <laughs> and, <laughs> and found him guilty. And I was like, all right. So I started to, um, listen to a little bit of the opening statements just to sort of get a feel for uh, what we were going into. And as I was putting together the opener for the show tonight, I was, I found some pictures and the girls uh, and I have been working on, you know, some getting more of the testimony and stuff like that. So I thought the best way to present this case, because it's not an incredibly long case, actually. Right. So I thought the best way to do it is to present it as it was presented back in 2019, starting with the opening statements from both the 
uh, prosecutor and the defense and then go through the first day of testimony, which is uh, Jeffrey uh, Fuller, which is Amy Fuller uh, Mullins's brother. Mm -hmm. And Eileen Fuller, I can't uh, off the top of my head remember how she is connected. That's I, her mom, I believe. I, is it her mom or her stepmom? Oh, that's a great question. I, I think it might be her stepmom because I remember in the beginning when they, there you go, Shemita's got it. Because when they were asking her questions in the beginning, they talked about how many kids she had coming into the marriage and he had coming into the marriage. Okay, so that was the stepmom. Okay. And then her, their son, uh, Tristan, this would be Todd and um, Amy's son, Tristan testifies also. So I thought we would start there. That's and, perfect. And, and then move forward day two, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously we're not going to be able to cover every single bit of the testimony, but like we couldn't with the chan with the Chandler Halderson case, but I want to, I want to highlight um, the important testimony. And then of course you guys can um, watch it. Uh, it's going to be up on Shermada's uh, channel. So um, go go over there and like and subscribe if you haven't already. And the and son's testimony is like imperative to like listen to. It is. It is. I caught. I just wanted to uh, hear. I only listened to like fifteen minutes of everybody's testimony, maybe ten on the shorter ones, so I could uh, discern whether it was like going to be integral to the time and it is so this is what we've come up with so i'm going to go ahead and play our it. new intro and then we're going to get right to it okay here we go Well, all right, there you have it. That's the new intro. All I did was really change the music. And now that I'm listening to it again, I'm thinking after the last video that I made about the Watts, now I'm kind of wondering if I'm some sort of subliminally or subconsciously trying to relive my rave days. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was really good. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't know. There's something about that kind of music that I just like. I'll probably always like it. I'll probably be, you know. <clears throat> I could see like I was bobbing my head. I'm like, shh, shh, shh. yeah, it's you like, just I didn't have any glow sticks or anything though. So I was, you know, I felt empty handed. Yeah. And you want to do the clap and the get, get your whistle out and everything. Hell yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, I had to write a letter of explanation to YouTube for that uh, music I used in that video. Yeah. You had to explain to them why you were having a rave on your channel? Well, I had to explain to them why I don't believe that this should be, uh, I should have a copyright claim. I felt that because if I were to remove the music, 
which was used for background, which I could have chose any music, um, the content would really still remain the same. And therefore, because it was a mashup, it was, in essence, transformative and did add value and therefore not a copyright issue. We'll see. Fingers Look at crossed. you. Look at you. <laughs> I had help. I mean, I was, Dr. B told me, hey, you should try to appeal it. And there's a thing for mashups. And I was like, okay. So then I wrote oh, the whole wow. thing out and then I, I uh, sent it over to her and she's like, perfect. And I said, all right, send. So we'll see what they say. <clears throat> I was thinking that maybe like YouTube was like, hey, the 90s called and they want their music back. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Not, the 90s were a fun I've been watching this new series on uh Hulu it's a uh it's like 90s this the most dangerous decade or whatever Vice did it it's really actually quite fascinating there's some stuff I want to go over about that but not tonight because that's not what we're here for although <laughs> before we get started I know that uh I just want to say this real quick about the West Memphis 3 I know that um Damien's defense lawyer uh Braga filed a request for the DNA. I'm just going to tell you guys that I read it quickly. I gave it a cursory read. I'll go, I'll look into it more in depth, but I don't think that based on what's in that filing, I don't think they're going to, the court is going to grant the request. Of course they can always appeal, which they will. And hopefully they give a better argument. Um, but I don't, I'm, I'm telling you guys right now, I'm used to it. This is one of those cases. So that's where I stand on that today. I think uh, there was some stuff that went on behind the scenes not that long ago, a couple of years ago, that <clears throat> really um, caused some issues and is going to make this uh, even more complicated than it already was to, in the first place. And so that is that. Um, let me go to what am i doing oh i need facebook so i can get these links right quick so yeah i'm a little bummed about that but i'm kind of used to it and that's the way this case goes it's you know the wills of justice do end up going kind of slow so i'm sure it'll, i'm sure it'll be resolved one way or another but that's just the way that it is i haven't even read it yet i saw it and tagged you in it that's all i know <laughs> <laughs> I know. And as soon as you tagged me in it, I was reading it. Here comes Shmita sending it to me. And I was like, all right, let me, uh, let me Let's peruse this for a moment. Yes. Let me just, let me just see what I can see. I, okay. I had pushed pause, Mr. Uh, officer of the court, Mr. Judge. I'm not ready to share the screen yet. Hold your horses. Um, but yeah, I looked at it and I was like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little concerned about this. Um, I don't know yet, Navigator, because we I just started. I haven't really watched a whole lot about this because I wanted to watch it with you guys for uh, for the first time. So but she's asking uh, the consensus about West Memphis Three's guilt. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Well, I'll, well, obviously, I think you guys all know mine. I don't. I don't think for myself. I don't know enough, but I know that I trust your judgment um, and then there's a couple other people that are very adamant that I know that you know they're really into like trials and true crime and things like that not just like the the social media aspect of it but like the court aspect mm -hmm. and they're pretty adamant that the, the boys are innocent so I'm going with I believe the boys are innocent the Alfred plea always kind of throws you anyway because that's them saying they didn't do anything so but I've never yeah. done that case. that's why I'm like you would run circles around me and I'd just be like Oh, really? Oh, wow. So I might as well just sit in the audience and watch your coverage. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's listen, this is a this is knowledge that I have accumulated over 20 years. And I will say this. And I, because I like you, because at Navigator, we've run into each other a few times on these YouTube streets. Even you don't have to think that they're innocent to be in my chat. I'm not that kind of a person. Everybody is entitled to to their opinion and assessment on the case. And the truth is that at this point with the Alford plea, they legally pled guilty while still maintaining their is innocence, which means that the, in the, in the eyes of the state of Arkansas, they have a guilty plea. And so I always have to throw that out there because um, 
I get comments, oh, you, you know, you don't know what the Alfred plea is. Yes, I do know what the Alfred plea is. So they are legally guilty. However, I believe that they are factually innocent. So, um, but I, I support everybody's um, opinions and how they came about them and, and all that stuff. All I ever have encouraged people to do with when I present the, the West Memphis three case is here's what wasn't in the documentaries. And more than that, here's where you can go find the information and read it for yourself and make your own judgment. And that's all I ever intended to do, you know? All right. So let's uh, get to it. Let me put uh, Mo up here so we can all watch together. We're going to watch. Uh, thank you, Gwen. I can't, I, like stand my, I can't stand my voice. There are so times I love your voice. Oh, thank you. I listen to myself on two times speed because I get so uh, annoyed with myself. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to add this to the stream. We're going to watch the uh, the state and the uh, defense's uh, uh, opening statements. All right. You ready? Here we go. Okay. And hi, everybody that I haven't got to say hi to. I oh, see all oh, of you guys. Oh, let me press. Yeah, let me press play. I'm a real professional. Good morning. Good morning. In the Iowa District Court, in and for Double Work County, State of Iowa Plaintiff versus Todd Michael Mullis. Number FECR 012-941. Trial information comes now to Laura County Attorney John Bernard and Assistant Attorney General Denise A. Timmons as prosecuting attorneys and in the name and by the authority of the state of Iowa accused Todd Mullis of murder first degree committed as follows. Todd Mullis on or about the 10th day of November 2018 in Delora County state of Iowa did kill Amy Mullis in violation of Iowa code sections 707.1 and 707.21A. A true information signed John Bernard, Delaware County attorney, signed Denise A. Timmons, assistant attorney general. To this charge, the defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. Thank you. Okay, and whenever the state is ready for opening statement, go right ahead. Yes, Gwen T, it is. Amy Mullis was a young and beautiful woman. She was 39 years old. She was a daughter a sister, an aunt, a friend, and a mother to her three young children. She was at her home on November 10th, 2018, and went outside to help do some work on her farm. But little did she know her death would come that morning. In Amy's last moments on this earth, she would feel the corn rake that she was stabbed with in her back. She would feel that rake pierce her body. She would collapse to the ground. Her lungs would fill with blood and air. And she would take those last breaths while she lie on a floor in a shed on her farm. Amy had so much life left to live but that life was viciously taken from her on November 10th, 2018, taken at the hands of this defendant. We would love for you to get to meet Amy, but you won't. Instead, you will share a courtroom with her killer. This brutal, senseless murder happened not far from here in a town called Earlville. And to understand what happened, we have to go back back to November 2018 and the time before that. Amy was not happy. She was having an affair and she was planning on leaving the defendant. 
the defendant knew something was going on. Amy had previously had an affair and they had reconciled. But in July 2018, the defendant knew she was having another affair. He confronted Amy and she denied it, but that just wasn't good enough for him. There was still a lot of tension and distrust and the defendant had to do something. Over time, this kept weighing on the defendant. He wasn't going to let Amy get away with cheating on him again. And more importantly, he wasn't going to let Amy take half of his farm. You see, the defendant grew up on a farm. His father's a farmer, his brothers are farmers. He became a farmer himself. Being a farmer means everything to him. He has put his life into that farm. The defendant had to find a way to keep his farm. He couldn't let Amy leave him and take his money or land or half of his farm. That morning, when Amy walked out of her house on November 10th, 2018, to do chores on the farm, it appeared to be a day like any other. Amy didn't know then what you will all know by the end of this trial. That walk that she had taken hundreds of times out of her front door to the hog barn would be her last and would lead to her death. What made this day different than any other day was the defendant and his cold and calculated plan. November 10th, 2018 was finally the day that Amy's husband of over 14 years was going to carry out his plan, a plan in which he tried to think of everything, tried to avoid getting caught, a plan in which he carefully waited to carry out until he felt like he had the perfect opportunity. The defendant made sure the only people at his farm that day were him, his wife, and his kids because he didn't want any other witnesses. He had gotten Amy outside to help do chores on the farm, and then he had to separate her so he could execute his plan. He sent Amy to a red shed to get something, and that's where he then attacked her and killed her. He used a corn rake because he tried to make it look like a farm accident. He was hoping that people would just feel sorry for him and not ask any questions. He then went back to the hog barn, distancing himself from the crime he just committed. Spoiler alert, they asked a lot of questions, which is why we're here today. He, do then? he sent his 13 year old son to go and find his mother who he had just slaughtered. The defendant acted like he was upset. He had to. This was his big moment, what he had been practicing and planning for months. He immediately started telling his story. He told 911 she fell on a corn rake. The defendant believed he thought of everything, but what he didn't count on was what happened next. Nobody believed his story. The doctors and law enforcement knew something just wasn't right. The doctors could tell that Amy was struck at least two times in the back with the corn rake. This was not an accident. It was a homicide. The defendant's plan wasn't so perfectly thought out. Now you're going to hear a lot about Todd and Amy's relationship before this happened. And you're going to hear about how Amy was fearful of the defendant, how she told her friends and family members that she was planning on leaving him, but that she was afraid that if he found out she was having an affair, he would kill her. And she also told another friend that he would make her disappear. But wait, that's not all. Because what you're also going to hear is that the way that we know that the defendant planned this was after the police executed a search warrant on his house. They collected the defendant's iPad that is connected to his personal Gmail account. And they were able to see searches in the months before Amy's death, proof that he was planning to kill Amy. 
looking up things like how to kill unfaithful women. The evidence in this case is overwhelming. And the trail of evidence leads to I want you guys to, to pay attention to the searches place. when it comes up. So we're because the searches are very, very strange for him today. to have been the one that and makes make them, my no opinion. mistake. The defendant oh, agree. this seat in this courtroom by what he did that day, November 10th, 2018. Say that part one more time, Teresa. So she talks about like the search that was on this iPad. Mm -hmm. so a whole bunch of issues with the iPad in general, which we'll talk about when we get to that testimony. But I just want them to pay attention to what they say about these searches, because if you listen to what she's saying right now and when the testimony comes out about the actual search history of the devices, the searches do not make sense for him to be the one that would make the searches, in my opinion. So I just want to kind of have everybody make sure they pay attention to the searches on this iPad. Yeah, I... um. I was curious about that myself in the fact that um, just on its face, is there a, is there a different technique one would employ to uh, murder a faithful wife versus murdering an unfaithful wife? Um, are there different? I just don't. That's a weird search to begin with to just type those words in. So right. That was, that's an issue. That's like a, a what for me. And then um, I know that they're going to, only because of what I'm hearing in the opening statement here, obviously they're going to put very heavy emphasis on this losing half of his farm. And only reason why I think that is because she's mentioned it twice within a span of two and a half seconds. Like she said it, and then she told a little other detail, and then she mentioned it again. So um, I, I'm curious to see where this is going so let's proceed she's much more um in tune with the case than some other attorneys we've watched recently i'll just say that correct correct <laughs> correct i'm sure that she's of the opinion that all lies i i mean l-i-e-s matter all lies matter all of them i, I have feelings on his attorney though <laughs> I got, I got some feelings there, too. <laughs> I, I did when I watched a little bit of his opening as well. So we'll get to we'll get to that. Let me push play. OK. OK. After you hear all the evidence in this case, the judge is going to instruct you on the law as it applies to the evidence. And then you will know that there is only one verdict, only one verdict supported by both the law and the evidence and only one just verdict, a verdict of guilty. I agree with some of what the state has just mentioned to you in opening. And already we're off to On a November fantastic 10th, start. 2018, in Delaware County, Iowa, Amy Mullis was viciously and deliberately murdered. The issue that you will have to decide in this case is really not who did it, but whether Mr. Mullis did. The evidence is much along the lines of what you've just heard. On November 10th, on that Saturday morning, Todd and his son, Tristan, who's 13 years old, went to another farm that they farm and manage, do some chores. There had been some chisel plowing, that's my term for it, had been done on that property the day before. And Todd's plan was to do some more on that Saturday. It had gotten cold, the ground was too frozen, so that plan had to be abandoned. Todd and Tristan returned back to the home place where the two younger children and Amy were up and about. They had a small breakfast and Todd and Tristan announced or stated that they were gonna go out to the hog barns and get ready for a delivery of small pigs. The Mullises had these large hog confinement barns and maybe I'll use, lose, use the wrong terminology here, but these are giant barns, much like a football field. And they bring in small pigs when they wait just their being weaned off the sow. 
<laughs> and then they're raised to butcher weight. Hold on, what'd you say? Do you think I should put it on two times speed? I feel like we could watch him on two times speed. <laughs> I feel like we could too. Let's see what happens if we do. Here we go. It might be too, it might be too fast, but he, does, yeah, me... he definitely is very uh, slow and monotone in the way that he speaks. Let me put him on 1.5 and see how that gets us. <laughs> Maybe it'll be more exciting. And pulled off the farm and sold. Oh, much better. They were getting ready for a delivery of those small pigs. And there was a lot of uh, mechanical things to be done in the barns. So they, and their plan was to go out and start that process. A few days before, I believe on November 6th, you'll learn that Amy had had a medical procedure. She was having some uh, bleeding problems, and the doctors had recommended that she have a, have a minor surgery, which it was done. I believe you will hear that the testimony was that Chief felt cooped up, had been in the house for several days, and wanted to join Todd and Tristan. It was her idea to go out and help work in the barns. And she did. And you'll hear that they, when they got out in the barn, each of them, Todd, Tristan, and Amy, set about to do different things. Todd was going to take these pipes, and I think you'll hear them referred to as nipple feeders. Uh, they were actually water pipes with small nipples on them so that these small pigs used to nursing off their mother will now nurse water from these pipes once they've been put in these pens. Todd was doing that. Objection, Tristan relevance. Tristan was getting these heaters that had been stored in a storage area that were, he would we bring these to know the pens and set them out ready to be installed. Get their water and milk. Amy was taking, there was uh, light fixtures above these pins in, in the walkways. And they were, as you might imagine, the, 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 with all these hogs, the manure and the smell, that there was lots of flies, not in November, but there had been when there had been pigs in the barn, the large hogs. So Amy set about to clean those fixtures off, to take the, the, the fly feces off of the, the globes around those lights. And to do so, she couldn't just stand and reach up and do it. She would use a, a pail sometimes or stand up on, on the, fence uh, partitions if she if there was a place to put her foot. And that's what they did. Uh, each kind of doing their own thing, all within proximity of one another. At some point, Todd noticed, Tristan noticed, that Amy seemed to maybe lose her balance, comment upon her dizziness. And this, this is something that Todd had witnessed even before she had had the medical procedure on November 6th. His comment was, honey, take it easy. Why don't you go back in the house? Don't push yourself. She wanted to help. So she continued on, and there was again... Uh, observation of her unsteadiness. So finally she agreed that she would stop what she was doing. Still wanting to help. Todd says, if, if you want to do something, there was a, a mother cat had a litter of kittens and they were being kept in the shop, which was in between the hog barns, a little off to the, as you look towards the house, a little off to the right. Somehow the mother cat had gotten run over by a skid steer or a pickup or a tractor or something. So the kittens were abandoned, were, uh, abandoned. Not abandoned they were just there by themselves orphaned each time that they'd open the door to get equipment in and out there was a fear that they were going to run over some kittens upset the, the smaller kids so todd says there's a pet carrier over in that old red shed you can go over and get it just put it up by the shop on your way into the house okay she leaves the hog barn todd and tristan continue to work they're doing these two chores of theirs at some point i believe you'll hear that tristan said the only time that he ever was out of his father's sight was to go into uh, an office area it's more of a just a separated area off the main part of the hog barn where there's uh, some equipment and he got a drink of water kind of just turned the faucet on there's a hose hooked to it and he thought he did that maybe twice and was out of the main hog area for a very short period of time todd was still in there he was in there when he went out to get a drink he was in there when he went back they worked for some period of time and i don't think there's a real good handle on what that period of time is maybe an hour hour and a half and at some point they look out towards the house and where you can see up by the shop where this pet carrier would have been placed by Amy per this plan, and it wasn't there. And Todd says to Tristan, why don't you go see what's going on and get that pet carrier if it's not up there. Tristan goes to the shed where an awful, awful thing had occurred. Tristan yells for his father. He comes, he finds her in the shed horribly with his corn fork stuck in her back. And you'll see pictures of this shed where you get in these sliding doors, which were kind of frozen open, but a pretty short width. And then you go in and there's a bunch of these plastic farm uh, sprayer tanks and you kind of turn to the left and then you go down this hallway. And in fact, down that hallway, there's some auger screws laying on the, on the floor. But there you see this pet carrier that's partially pulled out from a shelf. But Amy's out laying on her face or on her hands and knees, crunched over by the near the door. It's so horrible. Todd cannot get her out of the shed without taking that fork out of her back because the doors weren't wide enough. There wasn't enough room to move. So he did it. And he had Tristan help him get her in the pickup. 
literally laid across their laps, called 911 and proceeded to drive as fast as he could towards medical care. The 911 operator directs them to a certain location where the, uh, he or she, I can't remember, is sending law enforcement to meet them and ultimately emergency equipment. And they meet on a roadway out in the country and where Amy is then transferred from the pickup into an ambulance and taken to the hospital where she is soon pronounced dead. Tristan was taken by a friend, Michael Krogman, from the scene back to the farm. Two deputies had asked for him to do that, for, my, for Tristan to go back there so that he, they, he could show them what, where he found his mom, a little bit about what happened. And Tristan did that. Um, then Tristan went to the hospital where he meets with family. He's questioned briefly there by law enforcement. He basically tells you the story that I just told you. Not, maybe not in quite so much detail. Todd did state that he thought he had no other explanation. She went in the barn. She ends up with a fork in her back. She must have fell. He had no idea. But we will learn, you will learn, that she didn't fall in the fork. That there was four times on this fork, and you'll see it here in the courtroom, that there was more than four wounds to Amy's body. That she was struck more than once. But she, when, when she was there working in the barn, and you'll see pictures of her clothing, she had on several layers of clothes from a, a light shirt to another shirt. I believe, I think it was three layers. And one was a fairly heavy coat. So Todd couldn't see the wounds. Uh, there was some blood and that was about it, quite a bit of blood. So his explanation was the only one he could think of. This wasn't something he manufactured. It was like, what, what else could it be? She was dizzy in the, in the hog barn. Here she, we find her with this fork in her back. She was trying to get this pet carrier out of the shed. I don't have any other explanation. And that story remains consistent when he's questioned more to, uh, completely by law enforcement. Um, Tristan at the farm, at the hospital, later questioned at school, and later questioned at a professional, it's a CPC center, I think they call it, at St. Luke's Hospital in Cedar Rapids, where professionals are, who interview children who have been victims or witnesses, uh, he was interviewed there, and again, his story remains basically the same. Yes, I expect you're going to hear a history of this marriage, that approximately five years before this all happened, Amy was working at the hospital, I believe in Manchester, and that she had an affair with an individual. Todd ultimately learned about that affair. They, at the suggestions of friends and family, they went through counseling and they worked through it. I believe you'll hear testimony from Todd that his marriage was important. His children were important. The farm life was important to him, but not so important that he's gonna murder the mother, mother of his children and his wife. There will be sometimes perhaps confusing text messages uh, phone uh, contacts or information about what was said by Amy. But I think you will find that Todd continued to work towards maintaining his marriage throughout all this confusion. But behind his back, Amy was having a significant sexual affair with someone who actually came to the farm on a regular basis. A gentleman by the name of Jerry Frazier. He worked for a company that contracted these hogs into these various hog confinement facilities. And I think he'll testify that he was responsible for calling upon and servicing numerous hog operations like the Moses. So he knew the farm, he knew the people, he'd come there on a regular basis, and he and Amy would have business connect or conversations, business uh, communication, I guess I'll call it, about feed and, and medicine for the hogs and things that were going on on a, on a business level. But he would say that in the spring of 2018, it became a flirting thing and then it became a sexual thing. And, and um, it was extensive that he and Amy would meet on various locations at various times, and it was sexual. And I'm gonna say you'll, you'll find that somewhere around the first part, at least the first half of July, Todd saw some phone bills that would show the amount of messaging going back between Amy and Mr. Frazier, and it bothered him. It bothered him to the extent that he called Jerry Frazier and said, hey, what's going on? Is there, is there something going on? Frazier, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm just a nice guy. Amy wants the kids to get involved in, in showing pigs at fairs and stuff like that. And I help out a lot of people. And we got our regular contacts about the, the hog operation there at the Mose Farm. Don't worry, Todd. Todd even calls his wife. And she thinks Todd's crazy. She doesn't suspect anything. And, and I think it's pretty fair to assume that uh, Jerry Frazier convinced his wife that Todd was a little wacky and don't, don't pay attention to him. The affair continued. There was plans to meet at the state fair in Des Moines in August. Amy was telling people as soon as 
Jerry is, is ready and his kids have graduated and I'm going to get a divorce and so forth and so on. But I don't think Jerry was quite into it like she was. But it's, he admits it still continued right up until just a few days before this November 6th medical procedure. So I, I'm not going to try to lay out exactly all these text messages and, and communications, but there will be some. The Internet searches that the state mentioned, there were phones, there were Kindles, there were there was an iPad or excuse me, a laptop and there was an iPad. An iPad used extensively for the hog and farming operation. It would actually be taken out in the tractors when you were doing like, as I understand it, and I hope I'm not wrong, like GPS planning that you could coordinate with this iPad. And also it was used in the hog operation because it, it had better Wi-Fi or whatever the connections. I'm, I'm terrible with this stuff. I'm too old. But it had better connections so it'd be taken out in the shop. And that a dispute may be as to how many people had access to that and what the significance of these searches are, when they were made and why they were made. Folks, again, Tom Mullis' statements about Amy falling on a fork and dying accidentally was a honest, legitimate, on-the-spot explanation or an attempt to explain what happened to her. It was wrong. She was murdered. Horrible. But I believe that you will find that not only at the end of this case that there's a reasonable doubt about Mr. Mullis' guilt, but there's no doubt at all. Thank you. Okay. Excellent wow. suggestion to speed him up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Teresa. You you really came in in, a, in the clutch right there because yeah. That that all he yeah, he was almost bearable. But it's like, it's like he's talking normal speed when you have him on like one and a half times speed. Yes. 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 Now I understand some other people like that. I Yeah. <laughs> Me three. Uh, I understand speaking purposefully. Okay. There's nothing wrong with speaking purposefully, but that was ridiculous. And also how, how do you not remember you wrote this down? So how are these, this was your opening statement that you took the time to write down on this notebook paper, right? How, when you were writing this, did it occur to you to, I don't know, refresh your memory by looking at the, I don't know, the discovery that you have and finding out whether the 911 operator was male or female, if you were going to mention it at all. Why say, I don't remember, then to go on and say, I can't explain these iPads, these Wi-Fis, these, these laptops, these, these phones. I'm too old. I'm too old. I don't, I, I just don't have like my, my rotary phone that's attached to the wall at my house. Like, I don't know any of that technology stuff. Like, and why... <laughs> I say it was a murder when his client is saying it was an accident. Well, but he, ex he explained that. He said um, Todd gave an, an answer when he was asked initially based on what he thought at the in the moment. But he then later realized that it wasn't that's not what happened. I think that it was not a good time to mention that, though. I would have probably left that out. But. That's what he was trying to imply, yes. Or not even imply, that's what he was straight out saying. <laughs> well, I think because they came, you know, they came forward with the the six the six holes in her versus the four holes in her. So it would have had to have been multiple times that she was impaled by the corn rake. So it had to be purposeful. I'm not sure how much I buy that, but I, I'll wait until later before we talk about that. But I, I think because they're saying it's murder, like he's just trying to put it on somebody else. Right. right now, I will but this say is why, that for me, it's important that Tristan's Tristan's testimony is a, very important to me. Yes, yes, because he's Shmita! Shmita! <clears throat> he's really the only other witness. Ah, uh, thank you, Amy. I didn't see you sneak in. Hey, to everyone who has uh, snuck in while we while I was intently focused on this ramshackle opening statement by the defense, and I missed you guys. I'm glad to see everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I will say this. This specific video that I played is not the footage that I watched. I watched different footage, and it was from a different angle. And I will say this. I did notice that Todd sat relatively stoic throughout the entire prosecution opening statement 
and his attorney's opening statement up until he talked about the affair. And I'm not even, I'm not even joking. I'll find, I will find it. His eye twitched. I rewound it because I thought, surely I did not see what I thought I just saw. It did. Oh no, it, you saw it because it, it, he does it a few other times too. Yeah. You he, can, does, he has a thing that he does with his left eyebrow. Um, and he does it when the prosecutor's doing her opening, um, when she makes some comment about that Todd did this or Todd said that. And he's like, he does this like eye thing that he's just like, yeah, okay, lady. He it's does, almost he a couple like a tips. squint. Like he's, remember that show, Kids in the Hall? And they oh, yeah. used to stand and, and then do their hands and they close their eye and be like, I'm crushing your brain. Look at me right now. Look at I'm crushing your brain. It almost looked like that. Like that was what he was thinking inside of his head, but he knew that he had to be stoic. And so that's why just the eye would twitch. <laughs> it was weird. It was just interesting. It doesn't mean anything. It's just one of the things uh, you did, Callie. It's just one of those things I noticed. Um, also, Mr. Defense Attorney, whose name escapes me right this second. This is this technology you, you speak of. It's it's 2019, not 1994. <laughs> all right, like this, the the Wi Fi's, the tablets, the smartphones. They weren't in developed and are just now a thing. This isn't even new technology. This is technology that's been there for a while. Here's a novel idea. Take a class. Help. Get your grandchildren. They'll show you all the things. Okay. So I have to feel, I'm going to tell you a little side story real quick just because of this technology thing. Okay. Um, so remember last Thursday, I popped on for a hot minute right when we, right when you guys were doing, um, you know, Chaz. And I had to hop off because it was one of my first classes. So the professor comes on. It's an online class right now because campus is closed. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, I'm on Zoom. So he comes on. He's got to be my age, and I'm 42, so he's got to be right around that same age. Tells us a little bit about his history, and he's a public defender for Orange County. And um, he starts talking about how he doesn't understand technology, and he's not good with technology and how this online stuff isn't for him because, you know, he's just – he doesn't get it. And I'm thinking, <laughs> a public defender in this day and age probably wants to figure out technology. And Make I get, yourself like, get it. Yeah. And I'm like, and you're my age. I'm like, I'm not great with technology, but like I can open a zoom call. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 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 I can screenshot. I, oh, I could definitely, I could do it. I could do a badass screenshot. Me too. Like, like my phone is full of them. I can prove and, it. And occasionally I can throw out a, a halfway decent video with that has some good ass editing in it a few times. Okay. I'm just getting there. I'm not there yet. Don't, don't push me too hard. These girls will tell you. That it, I forced myself. I would work and work and work and work and work and re-edit and re-edit and re-edit to the point where I'm really surprised I didn't get blocked from the group chat, if I'm being completely honest. I annoyed <laughs> myself. I was like, Jen, if you go in that chat one more time, I'm going to block you. <laughs> I was so annoyed with myself. To be removed. Somebody just get rid of me at this point. Yes, just <laughs> remove me. <laughs> I need to be removed. I'm out of control. But <clears throat> I don't understand not, okay, there's a lot of things in this life, uh, this world that I don't know about. But you know what the good thing about not knowing things is? The Googles. You can find out. Do you know how many times I used YouTube to figure out how to fix stuff around my house? Like one time, um, my treadmill had to, I didn't know what was wrong with that. I went to turn it on one day. I went to get on it. And after so many miles on a treadmill, you have to reset it. Well, I didn't know how to do any of that. And I certainly don't know where I put that stupid manual. I probably threw it away. I'll never need this. Guess where I hit up? The YouTubes. And guess what I figured out how to do? Reset uh -huh. it. Hello. You can get anything. You, the internet is full of good things. And for the most part, so is the YouTubes, as long as you're not in the chroma community. <laughs> well, I just think I've had a hard time when you're when part of the prosecution and part of the discovery is being brought to this defense attorney and states that the reason they find that that you know he should be convicted of this murder has to do with technology and the defense attorney and I know he's got a team of people blah 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 but the defense attorney in the opening statement is like oh yeah I don't really get that stuff well 
well, what are you going to do the rest of the trial when half of their evidence is in regards to technology? Right. And as, as a defense attorney, and really, whether you're the defense attorney or the prosecutor, you, <clears throat> if you cannot understand the evidence being presented, how are you going to expect the jury to understand the evidence that's being presented? See, I'm always of the opinion that it, it doesn't matter how smart you are. If you cannot get the knowledge out of your brain and, and in, out of your mouth and explain it to somebody else so that they can learn from your knowledge, then what good is it? It's really pointless. You know what I mean? Right. I think all attorneys should learn technology because majority of the cases now revolve around technology. It'd be 100%. like a surgeon not learning new surgical procedures. Right. 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 Not knowing, not knowing uh, how to use dissolvable stitches. You know, or it's just anything new. It's it's especially like the if it, Dr. Now can learn how to use the robot, this attorney can learn technology. Yeah, bless his little heart. I love it when he scoots the stool up there to the operating table and gets up on it. It's my favorite part of the whole show. <laughs> That's why I used him as an example. <laughs> it's my favorite part of the whole show. I love me some Dr. Now. But I feel like, okay, so I got to say, her opening was better than his opening was, but it sort of still left me like, huh, wanting a little bit more. I don't know. Maybe I'm just too, too used to like flashy opening statements and from the defense and from the prosecutor. I, don't I know. found them both to be very dry. Mm -hmm. and and not good at open they should not be opening and and we'll see later how well they do but yeah uh, they were both very dry they did not captivate an audience and as a juror i would have been bored me too and you want to i think that the opening to me if i were a juror it's like you need to be impassioned because part of being an attorney is a little bit of salesmanship. So you 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 have to sell the story. And the only but when you sell a story, you're really selling yourself. So if the if you're coming across as dispassionate as if you don't have a stake in it or you're just like, "Hmm, whatever." You know what I mean? If you're like have the whole uh personality of say Squidward, right? You just don't really care either way, then the jury's not going to care either way. And you, as, as the uh prosecutor, you're speaking for the victim. You must be passionate. And then as the defense attorney, you're speaking for the defendant and you're trying to convince a jury of 12 human beings. And we all know how people are. OK, like if juries were made up of of animals, we'd all be fine because animals get it. People never get things. They just be thinking things wrong and doing things for no reason. And they're hard to figure out. But you got to sell the story. And I just didn't get that from them. Like I didn't get think didn't feel like they cared. I'm on the same page. Me too. Plus, they hauled in the assistant attorney general to prosecute this. This isn't the ADA. Like, it's been a while since I've been in government, but I feel like the assistant attorney general outranks the DA and the uh, assistant DA for sure. Like, that's, you know... Why? I don't know. All right. So I think what's next? The uh, brother. All right. Yeah, you find. could probably speed him up too. Okay. I'll do that. Because it's, we've been an hour and I want to get to the son, Tristan. All right. Sorry, Miss sorry. Man? Not telling you how to run your channel. <laughs> A little bit you kind of are. <laughs> You're sure. All right. I'll talk to you later. Good night, Jeanette. You, you're, you're just strongly suggesting. You're impassioned. <laughs> His defense attorney could take a, a couple of notes from you. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. This makes you click so many times. It's so annoying. All right. Ready? Here we go. Did you graduate from high school? I graduated from Eldorado Providence High School in 1994. And did you receive any additional schooling? Yes, I uh, got my bachelor's degree in occupational safety and health, and I have a master's degree in organizational leadership. 
And what is your current occupation? I'm the human resources manager at American Packaging Corporation in Story City, Iowa. Now, you indicated earlier that you lived with Amy Moss. Yes. Who is Amy Moss? Amy is my sister, um, my, my younger biological sister. Do you know Amy's birthday? Amy's birthday was January 23rd, 1979. Love you, Scottish Queen. Go get some sleep. Good night, Scottish Queen. Thank you for coming. Yes. Maybe we'll do this a little earlier tomorrow night. No, because it's not good for Teresa. No, I'm good with that. I can do Are early you? tomorrow. Yeah, I can okay. do early tomorrow. Okay, perfect. That's, yes, that's what we'll my do. Sister Amy. And is this a true and accurate depiction of Amy and what she appeared to be uh, prior to November 2018? Yes. I don't know, Tony, because we're hilarious. Before you publish it, uh, <laughs> we should have it offered first. Are you offering it in evidence? Any is this one too fast for you guys? One is, is it too admitted, fast for you? You may publish. No, I'm used to listening to everything on two times. Me so too. I, so this is even a little laggy for me. Yeah. So, so I, should, I know that other people are like, what the hell are you listening to when I do that? So I just want to make sure that they can hear. You're right. Thank you for, yeah. So should we slow it down, guys? Or what do you think? That's not Todd's uh, brother, Sugar Beat. That is Amy's brother. Uh, try 1.25. Okie dokie. Oh, wait, that's not even the right. Let me open up the right window. This window. All right. Here we go. Yes. Is that a photograph of Amy? Yes, it is. Um, she had been a registered nurse and um, she had left that to work on the farm with uh, the family farm. And did, uh, did Amy graduate from the same high school as you? Yes. And what high school was that? Eldor New Providence High School. What kind of things did Amy like to do? Amy loved um, being outside, hunting, fishing, um, playing golf, but her biggest pride and joy was uh, being a mom to her kids. You indicate, how many kids did Amy have? Amy had three children. Did you, what are their names? Tristan. Taylor, and Wyatt. And their last name? Mullis. Do you know Todd Mullis? Yes. And do you see Todd Mullis in court today? Yes, ma'am. Can you please point to him and identify an article of clothing that he's wearing in court today? <laughs> I Amy, mean, I just saw your comment. Your Honor, may the record reflect an in-court identification of the defendant by this witness? It will. Now, uh, you indicated that Amy, prior to her death, was actually working on the farm. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And prior to that, what kind of work did Amy do outside of the home? She was a registered nurse. And where did she go to school for nursing? Uh, Kirkwood. Now, you indicated that you, you, you met Todd Mullis. Yes. When did you first meet Todd Mullis? I met Todd uh, shortly after I got out of the Navy. Um, it would have been 2003 or 2004 in that time frame. And do you, re do you recall what year Amy and Todd got married? I believe they got married in 2004. I almost can't listen to anything on normal speed anymore. Amy and I had a good relationship. Um, we would call and text. Um, we got together on uh, holidays and family events. Um, I would go see some of her kids' events. She would come see some of my kids' events. Um, we had a good relationship. Who are your parents? My parents are Robert and Robert Fuller and Peggy Munson. And so would it be fair to say that Robert Fuller is your father? Yes. And where does Robert Fuller live? He lives on the farm that we grew up on. And is Robert married? <laughs> yes. And who is he married to? Yes, he's married to Eileen Fuller. And you indicated that your mother's name is Peggy Munson? Yes. And where does your mother live? My mom lives in Ankeny with her husband, Randy Munson. Did you and Amy ever talk about her relationship with Tom? Occasionally. Um, back in around the time that Wyatt was born, which um, she said that she had not been happy and she was just not happy back then. How old is Wyatt currently? Wyatt is nine. And how old is Taylor Mullis? Taylor's 11. And how old is Tristan Mullis? Tristan is 14. You indicated that you had this conversation with Amy when Wyatt was born? Right around the time he was born. And where did that conversation take place? Um, I think it was at my dad's house, but I'm not positive. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to sometime around August 2018. Yes. Around that time, or was there anything going on in your family? Yes. What was going on? My, our grandma, uh, Margaret, who is my mom's mother, mother, had fallen and was in the hospital in Des Moines. Um, and the prognosis was not, not good. I... Amy had gone to the hospital the day before I had gotten there. Um, and then I met Amy outside of the hospital when we got there. Um, Jeff, let me just stop you there. Yes. Um, so would it be fair to say that you and Amy were visiting your grandmother who was in the hospital? Yes. 
Now, at some point while you were at the hospital, did you have a conversation with him? Yes. And where in the hospital did this conversation take place? We were outside the emergency room exit. Um, she she met me there. She was my, me and my wife. She was going to escort us up to grandma's room. Was your wife present for this conversation? Yes. And what's your wife's name? Morgan. And what, if anything, during that conversation did Amy tell you? Oh, Jeff calls for your sick. You want to respond, Ms. Hughes? Um, Judge, I believe based on the, the response to all of these statements that um, the, that these statements are all um, all admittable or are pursuant to the case law as well as the rules of evidence. Well. Um, if you want to tell me specifically what rule you think creates the exception, it would be hearsay. If there's an exception, if you want to tell me what the rule is. Judge, first, the state's position is that it's not hearsay because it's to show the state's mind of the victim and to show that she was fearful of the defendant, not that the actual acts happen that he's about to testify to, um, Your Honor. And then further than that, I think that um, if Your Honor does uh, believe that they're for the truth of the matter asserted, it does go towards the victim's state of mind, its present sense impression, and it also um, falls under the residual hearsay rule that we did file a notice of. Without having heard the testimony of the witness, uh, but believing I understand, I, I believe he's going to give testimony about uh, the present sense impression or the then existing state of mind of the declarant. I'm going to overrule the objection for now and let him answer. Do you remember the question? Yes. Go ahead. You can answer. So that conversation, um, when my wife and I uh, approached Amy, um, she said that she was planning on getting a divorce and she was going to leave Todd um, and that he was going to flip out. Did she tell you when she would be leaving Todd? At that time, she said it'd be a little bit later after the crops were out of the field. Did she indicate to you uh, that she was going to divorce Todd or just leave him? Uh, she was going to divorce him. Did your grandmother pass away from um, that time in the hospital? Yes, yeah, she passed away that same day. And shortly after your grandmother passed away, did you go anywhere to um, take care of her belongings? Yes, um, my wife and I, uh, my mother, her husband, and my aunts and uncles um, helped clean out grandma's house. Um, Jen, did you catch you did that little eyebrow well, thing? Were those all the people that were present? Yes. On that day that were <laughs> yes. While that was happening, did you and Amy have a, a conversation? Yes. Was it just the two of you at that time? I believe so. There may have been some people that overheard the conversation. Um, we were all just around in the what area. did Amy tell you that? Okay. Amy asked me if she could store um, grandma's couch and some chairs and lamps at my house um, so that she would have some furniture when she left Todd. Did you then take any of that furniture? Yes. And where I, did you put it? I stored it. I still have it in my garage. I had set it on some pallets and covered it um, with some tarps to keep the animals off of it. And why, why did you keep that furniture? So she would have furniture to when she moved out. So she would have something to, to start, start off with. For context, though, you, you said this conversation, conversation happened when Wyatt conversation, was uh, born, right? Conversation. right? Yes. She said she no, was well, I think there's a couple. Shemita, are you backstage? Will you push pause for me, left. please? Because I'm outside. Tristan would be angry with Amy for leaving. When was the last time you spoke to Amy? The last text message was the day oh, before Shemita, she Oh, Shemita, hold on a sec. No, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Yes. We'll just watch. Yeah. And we'll talk about it in a minute. Okay. She had had a procedure earlier in the week, um, and she had sent me a picture of um, a bruise on her arm from the IV that was uh, not put in very well, apparently. At any point, did you have a conversation with Amy about an argument or fight that she had with her mother-in-law? Yes. And how did that conversation take place? Was that in person or over the phone or text message? That was over the phone. And approximately when did that conversation take place? It happened shortly uh, after, it would have been sometime in October. Um, we had been at the hospital with my uncle who had had a, a brain bleed. Um, and Amy had come down. We were with mom in the hospital to support her because she had just lost her mother. And now her brother was in the hospital and it didn't look very good at the time. Around this time, was Amy spending a lot of time in the Ankeny or Des Moines area? Yes. And what specifically did Amy tell you during that conversation? During the conversation, after she'd gotten home, um, she went to pick up her kids from her mother-in-law. And she said that her mother-in-law um, was was um, talking very negatively at her, told her that Amy would, had been abandoning her, her children and didn't deserve to be a mother and was just a horrible person. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Cross-examination. Thank you, Honor. I would have objected for hearsay. They did, and he Not was overruled. 
You have it right there. I would have objected for here today. But this yeah, mother, right. mother-in-law uh, testimony, I would have objected again. Oh, yeah, th you're correct. You're absolutely correct. That was hearsay. Yeah, she can she can testify herself. And yeah, that, and uh, he can testify to what Amy so told him directly about what Amy said, not with the mother-in-law. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. You're exactly right. Yes, he was hospitalized in Des Moines. You know, do you recall approximately how long he would have been in the hospital? He was in the hospital for a few weeks, and then he went to On With Life to help with his recovery. During the time that he was in the hospital or at On With Life, did you visit him? Yes. Did Amy? Yes. Do you have an estimate of how many times Amy might have visited? I don't know how many times she went. I know the one time um, was the last time I saw her alive. We went out for supper with my mom to help support her during that time. So every time you visited your uncle, it didn't necessarily coincide with a visit from Amy. That would be correct, yes. So really, you'd only be able to guess how many times she might have visited. I could guess, but I don't have an answer. Do you know if, if, if there were ever any times that Amy combined a visit to her uncle and her mom with activities uh, that uh, Taylor was engaged in, the tumbling, I believe, that she participated in? I don't know if she did that or not. And you believe it was sometime in October that Amy told you about having the run in with Todd's mom? Yes, I remember she would. We had just left um, Uncle Jerry's, the hospital that he was in, um, and I had gotten home, and she got home the day after, I believe, and she called me. Did she ever talk to you again about and, and tell you that Todd had actually stood up for her and, and, and criticized his mother for doing what she did? No, I think that might have been the last time I talked to her uh, in person before she was killed. He just said that was on the phone, no? Oh no, the the no. mom, the mother-in-law was in person. Yeah, I, I think this. I think there's going to be a phone call come that he does talk about. Okay. Yeah, Amy, they're just trying to set the stage right now for that. Yeah. Like she was afraid of him. Yeah. She was afraid of Todd and afraid of leaving him. Were you aware that? Yeah, they're they're just trying to lay the foundation about the state of Amy and Todd's relationship and the way that she felt about <clears throat> him and, uh, toward, you know, uh, the closer it got to when she died. Which I still, I have, I will talk about those issues. I have issues with that as well. Yeah. Amy had had this affair about five years ago. No. Were you aware up until the time of her death that she was having an affair? No. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's all I have. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Sir, can you spell Uncle Jerry's last name for the record? G-R-A-N-Z-O-W. Okay, thank you. You're free to step down. Thank you. Do you swear and affirm that the testimony you give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Go ahead and have a seat. All right, you want to talk about, you talk about brother first? Eileen Fuller, E-I-L-E-E-N-F-U-L-L. -L. Let let. Oh my God! Let me unmute myself and learn how to use this stream yard. I'm only been technology lying. Technology is hard. I know it's so hard. Let me get on YouTube and see if they'll tell me how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's some. If only there was a tutorial, I could learn these things. I could learn. Okay, what do you think so far, Teresa? What are you um, thinking? Well, so because because I know a little bit, you know, futuristic of what comes up here. I I. I but when I watched it, I'm trying to go back to when I watched it the first time because I watched it in order of the trial. And so I had a problem with this guy's testimony and and not because of what he was saying, but because nobody was objecting to half the shit this guy said that really had no relevance to anything at this point. They had not laid any foundational evidence to say that this guy had any credibility whatsoever. Correct. I, agree. I, ha I have a big problem with that. Like why as an attorney was this defense attorney not fighting that this guy is not credible right because he's not he wasn't proffered as an expert witness he's only 
uh, he that's not the right phrasing. Let me rephrase, Your Honor. He is the victim's brother, which go, he he would have a motive to embellish or to spin a narrative a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so while I understand why the, the prosecution has offered him initially and why they're, cause I, I did watch her testimony, Eileen's testimony. Um, I understand what they're trying to do. However, I agree with you, Teresa, there were several fundamental procedural errors. First of all, there were a couple of times when, uh, there was leading and leading is important because the, the attorney isn't supposed to be giving testimony. The person mm -hmm. on the stand is giving testimony, which is why when it's your witness, you're not allowed to lead. They'll notice that they don't raise objections on cross for leading because it's not their witness. And you are generally speaking allowed a little bit of leeway when it comes to that on a cross. But when it's your witness, absolutely not. And there were some parts in there um, that weren't actually really relevant. Mm -hmm. You know, um, for example, the furniture. Are they going to offer another witness who can also, who, who can say that that's why he stored furniture in his shed or wherever he had it. I don't understand the relevance of that. Well, and if, if half the farm is hers, why would she be moving out? Why is she? I, yeah, there's just a bunch of weird things to me with that whole thing. And I have a problem with why the defense attorney doesn't ask more questions after he says, so, you know, your sister was having an affair. This is her second affair, mind right. you. Did you know that your sister was having an affair? So I would have laid a little bit of foundational. So you, you believe that your sister was being honest with you when she said that she was afraid of Todd and that she was going to be leaving him. Do you believe that your sister was truthful with you? Do you believe that your sister, you know, always told you the truth or was an honest person? And then, hey, did you know that your sister was having an affair and that this was her second affair? Because to me, your sister's not afraid of this guy when she's out there gallivanting around. There's not a lot of fear because... If he catches me cheating, you know, or if he, if I leave him, he's going to hurt me. Uh. Right. And that's, that, that's an excellent um, uh, point because is, could it be that she, t maybe she did actually tell her brother that maybe that is an, an actual and factual conversation that they did have. However, what if it is pot? What if what she said to him was because she didn't want to tell her brother that she was having an affair. Mm -hmm. That's, you know what I'm saying? And as a defense attorney, he should have absolutely raised those questions a hundred percent. And he didn't. And he's not going to get another opportunity. This is nope. ridiculous. Yeah. So, okay. We can keep going. Unless anybody right. else has something they want to add. Mo? No, sure, number sorry. Four. Okay. <laughs> I was putting laundry over. So no, no. I'm sitting on mute. <laughs> can I have like, uh, one one pile of PJs. Can you put mine away too? <laughs> I hate putting away laundry. All right, here we go. Oh, E R. Go ahead, counsel. You indicated your name is Eileen Fuller. Correct. Could you tell us how old you are? I'm uh, 54. Where do you currently live? Uh, Iowa Falls, Iowa. Where did you grow up? Strawberry Point, Iowa. And where did you go to school? Starmont High School. What is your current occupation? Uh, sales and advertising. Are you currently married? I am. And who are you married to? Robert Fuller. Do you have any children? I do. And who are your children? Whitney Gam and Zachary Converse. And when did you and Robert Fuller get married? Uh, 2004. And does Robert have any children? He does. And who are his children? Jeffrey Fuller and Amy Fuller. When you first met Amy, uh, when did, or when was that? Uh, in 2002. How did you meet Amy? I met her through a mutual friend. And what kind of relationship did you have with Amy? We were friends. And when you first met Amy, was her name was Amy Fuller. Fuller. And um, what kind of things would you and Amy do together? Go to dances. Uh, she'd come to my house. We'd barbecue, swimming. I mean, just did a, a lot of everything together. During that time when you first became friends with Amy, did you meet Todd Mullis? Uh, not, for, not for a while. And how was it that you did meet Todd Mullis? Through Amy. 
And um, how did you meet your current husband, Robert Fuller? Through Amy. Uh, do you recall when you met Todd Mullis? Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to say that I met Todd in July of 2003. And when did Todd and Amy get married? Todd and Amy were married September 11th, 2004. And when were you and Bob or Robert Fuller married? July 31st, 2004. So just a little over a month before you and Bob got married a little bit over a month before Todd and Amy. Correct. Did you have a relationship with the defendant, a friendship, a relationship? How did you get along? Todd yes. and I got along fine. And um, when you initially moved on to, into the farm in Eldora, uh, would Todd spend any time on the farm? He did. And in what capacity? He and his father rented the ground. Uh, so they were there twice a year to put in the crops and take out the crops. Were you aware um, several years ago, about five years ago, that Amy had an affair? I was. And how did you find out about that affair? Uh, I found out through Amy. After that affair, um, what did you observe about Todd and Amy's relationship? We didn't see them a whole lot. Uh, they seemed to be working things out. After that, um, after you found out about that first appear, uh, affair, excuse me, do you remember a time when you had a conversation with the defendant? I do. And yes. approximately how long after that affair was this conversation? I'm going to say right around two, two and a half years after. And who, where did that conversation take place? In my kitchen. Was anybody else present for that conversation? It was just Todd and I. Uh, the, the rest of the family was in the basement watching TV. It was a holiday. They were watching football. What did the defendant, Todd, say to you at that time? He said, Eileen, do you know what Amy did? And I said, yes, Todd, I do. And he said, I said to him, it looks like you're working things out. Did he then say anything else to you? He did. He said, well, we ha I have to. He said, I'm not going to lose my farm and what I've worked for. Now, in the summer and fall of 2018, did Amy have anything going on in her life that you were aware of? In 2018? Yes. Yes. Um, Amy was having um, some health issues at the time. And was there anything going on with her mother's side of the family? Yes. Yes. Uh, she had lost her grandmother. And was anybody else in her family also in the hospital? Yes. Not long after her grandma died, I know that her uncle had an aneurysm. And were you aware of where Amy was spending a lot of time then? She was down in, in Des Moines at the hospital, I was told, spending a lot of time with her, helping with her uncle. Now, at the same time that Amy um, was dealing with these family issues, did you have contact with the defendant? Um, Todd had called me uh, several times and uh, discussing, worried about Amy not being home. Now, you said he called you. Um, would he call you on your cell phone? Correct. And did you guys communicate any other way? Texting. He would text me. And did he specifically, did Todd say anything to you about um, Amy spending so much time at the hospital? Yes. What did he say to you? He just said, um, I just, I, she needs to be home helping with the kids. Um, it was a very wet fall. I know he was trying to get the crops out. This is I leading. Very aggravating. Hey, print ready. Um, the kids were there. So he had a lot on his plate. How often would the defendant call you? Most of it was through texting. Um, he did call on occasion. And did you make any observations of the defendant uh, behavior or how he was when he would talk to you or send you these text messages? Most, mostly angry, just frustrated anger. And did these conversations with the defendant go on for a couple of months? Yes. And did the defendant, did Todd ever talk to you about his, about his relationship with Amy? He just said that they were, they were obviously having issues. He didn't go into extreme detail, no. Um, at some point, did you have a conversation with Todd about um, him suspecting that Amy was having another affair? Yes. And was that, if you recall, was those, were those text messages or phone calls? Uh, both. And specifically, what did the defendant, Todd, say to you about that? He just said... Um, he was, he had uh, confronted the field manager. Um, I didn't really catch a name that he specified. Um, it was his field manager. And he said that he had, you know, he had asked him about it. He had confronted he and Amy both. And did he tell you what led him to confront them about it? Uh, he said that via her phone, he could tell that, you know, she was contacting him. They were contacting each other. And at any point did the defendant ask you for advice or ask you what you thought he should do about it? He did. Yes. And what, if anything, did you tell him? I said, I don't know, Todd, if that was me, I guess I would talk to his wife. I didn't. That's what I would do. At that point, did you know who this person was that Todd was alleging she was having an affair with? No. Had no. you ever met him or did you even know his name? No. Did Todd ever tell you um, about a fight between Amy and his mother? Yes. And again, was that text or phone calls or both? Um, he had texted me uh, and said that Amy and his mother had just gotten into a fight. Um, that was basically it. Did he tell you anything else about that fight? Something about... Uh, his mother just, and Amy, had, I'm not sure why Amy was there, um, what that situation was. He just said that Amy, her mom kicked Amy out of the house. 
meaning her home. Can I just have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. I'm sorry, Print Ready, that you're in a weird mood. This is a weird case, so it might be perfect. <laughs> I hope you feel better. <laughs> Jen trying to be half half full. <laughs> I didn't realize that she was friends with Amy, and that's how she met her Amy's yeah. dad, who she married. Yeah. yeah. When yeah. It's weird. I forgot I all about you. <laughs> I noticed it immediately. I said, wait, what? <laughs> Perhaps today I missed it. That this happened two or three years, the conversation with you and Todd after that had occurred? Correct. Two, about around two and a half years. I didn't write the dates down. Does anybody else find it weird, though, that he says, do you know what Amy did? And she's all, I do, that Todd. Conversation like, yes. as her friend, like, what are you talking about? What do you that, mean? What did she do? Be me. It was a family. My name is like, that's in between you. anymore. Who? Amy and the kids there. Amy who? What are you talking <laughs> about? <laughs> <laughs> who? I would have pulled a she's whole, like, I would have pulled a whole dulce, uh, dulce. Huh? What? <laughs> who? Dulce? Where's the hand sanitizer? <laughs> <laughs> I would have been like, mm -mm. And it, why is Todd messaging her so much? Right? See, I was going to bring that up too. Why is he? Okay, this is where it doesn't make sense. First of all, she is, a, before she was Amy's mother in law, she was Amy's friend. And it's they, Iowa. What does that mean? I don't know. I was just being facetious. <laughs> I have no I don't know how Iowa is either. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. We, we can decide someone's guilt, but we don't know where a state is. <laughs> I know where Iowa is. I just don't know how they be acting in Iowa. Okay. Me either. That's why I'm like, oh, it's <laughs> Iowa. Maybe that's just kind of how it goes there. Yeah, maybe Your it's Mary I want to know. I want to know about the dances they went to. Right? right? Barn like, dances. Like barn dances? Yeah, That's barn dances. Uh -huh. I feel like, remember that movie Footloose? <laughs> There's a lot of boot scoot and boogieing going on. I feel like it was like Footloose. It's like Footloose. Oh, see, I felt more like Amish. Yeah, but remember they held their prom in a barn. It was like barn barn raves. Yeah, like a barn rave. <laughs> I love Footloose. Me too. <laughs> Raven in the barn, in cows in the field. <laughs> <laughs> See, now your intro is so fitting because they were at all these dances together. Like, bing, 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 bing. Oh, boy. At least we make ourselves laugh. Of course. What's the, if you can't laugh, what's the point? I just don't understand why he would be okay. Do I understand why he would initially reach out to her? Yes, because where would you reach out if the shoe were on the other foot? A wife would go to the best friend. Like, if your husband ever comes to me and asks me if you're cheating on him, I'm gonna be like, uh, right, but you have to think like a dude. If, if. Amy, if the shoe were on the other foot and Amy suspected Todd was cheating, she would have gone to Todd's best friend, not expecting Todd's best friend to tell her anything. However, women can, well, all people can, if they pay attention, gauge a rea just the reaction to the question. You don't even have to answer it. And people, just by the way you react to the question being asked is very, very telling. And, and as uh, uh, girls would do that, right? Through text message? No, they talked in the kitchen first, though. Okay. Okay. But I so still that, have a problem with it. He's like, you know what Amy did, and she's like, I do. Yeah. Like, really? Like, like well, throw her straight under the bus? No well, shit. That's, well, that's straight violating girl code. I mean, let's and start why there. Todd not like, well, what do you know? You know what I mean? Like exactly. Maybe, but yeah, I totally know that she, you know, went to Ralph's and not Bonds and didn't and told you she went to the wrong grocery store or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, how do we know we're on the same page? Right. Do you know what Amy did? Like, let me just say this. If Lonnie were to ask Mo that question, do you know what Jen did? Mo would be going through an entire Rolodex of things that Jen did in her brain oh, that Lonnie shit, yeah. could possibly be talking about. <laughs> and be like, huh? 
Oh, she and she was not only her friend, she was her mother or stepmother. Yeah. Yeah. Stepmother. What I say? Like, Mother-in-law. Beep, beep, beep. It's, it's, just, like that. it's just, I can understand him reaching out. What I can't understand is people will only continue to reach out if you continue to give them information. Right. If she would have Well, he knew she was an open book. Yeah. She so gave, he's like, let's talk to stepmom because she'll give me all the info. Correct. All I got to do is isolate her in the kitchen during <laughs> on Thanksgiving during a football game, and she'll tell me everything. <laughs> All right. And if you guys are putting together a timeline here, because this is how my brain works, this is where I come into my very first issue that I had with the testimony and the, and the course of this case, because both of these witnesses are talking about grandma, super sick, right? Mm-hmm. Uncle, super sick. All this time at the hospital, all this time at the hospital. And now you have Todd over here who's like, holy shit, I've got three young kids, this farm, I've got to do all this. Like, I need some help. And he starts to figure out that she's probably having another affair. So they keep pushing this like, oh, yeah, she's at the hospital. Oh, yeah, she's at the hospital all the time. She found time to not only be at the hospital, but also to have this affair. And he's over here trying to hold down the farm and take care of the three kids. Correct. Right. Correct. So. All right. Let's see what this, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be valuable. Let's see what else this bus driver here. has to add. Let's see. In your opinion, did Todd love his children? Yes. Love his career, his farm life? Yes, very much. Hard worker? Very hard. And you saw evidence of that because him and his dad rented ground from your family. Correct. Moving ahead then to, to late summer, or summer, August, September of last year, 2018. I'd be you late summer, Todd early fall. Communicated with you with concerns about Amy being absent from the home. Correct. And that was due to health issues of both grandma and uncle. Correct. You mentioned uh, his plate full. Crops coming out about that time of year. Correct. Do you know how much land the Mullis Todd's operation was? I don't exactly. I know. I know they have quite a bit of land. Pretty substantial. Right, and renting and vice versa. Yes. And it sounds like what from what you're telling us that Amy was doing this family health issue visits without the kids going with her. I can't say that for a hundred percent I all the time that she was there, but I know when Todd had talked to me, they were at home. So Todd's got the three kids and farm and weather issues and so forth. You, you said he was angry, frustrated. He seemed angry, frustrated. Yes. But is this also about the time that he told you that he had some suspicions again about Amy's fidelity? Correct. And that he had talked to this farm manager? He said he had talked to him, yes. Did he seem satisfied that the explanation he got explained things? Objection calls for speculation. Uh, I'm going to let her answer yes or no. Do you understand the question? Can you repeat that, please? Did it appear that Todd seemed satisfied with the explanation he had received from this farm manager? He didn't say either way. He just said he had, he had asked him, confronted him. But you then encouraged him to to contact this man's wife? He, he asked me what I would do. I said, I guess if it was me, I would talk to his wife. Do you know if he did that? I do not. One eternity later. And then you reporting that Amy shared with you that she had I'll call it a run-in with Todd's mom. Uh, Todd told me that. Right. And the issue was Amy's absence from the home. Was that kind of the... Sounded like that was the basis of the argument, yes. Me too, truth and transparency. <laughs> I don't. He had just told me that his mom had kicked her out. That's about the extent of that. Did he also tell you that he confronted his mom about what she had said and done with Amy? I don't believe so. I don't recall that. You're not saying it didn't happen. He just. Right. Okay. 
We can hear you whispering. You mentioned that Todd had made a comment to you back at this holiday thing a few years after the first affair that he didn't want to lose the farm. Isn't it true that he also added he didn't want his family to be split up? No, he didn't say that. He said, I'm not going to lose my farm and everything I've worked for. Somebody has a hot mic in the courtroom. I can hear it. Maybe this is incidental here, but the farm ground that Todd and his dad rented, who did that belong to? Robert Fuller Sr. Amy's dad. Amy's grandfather. Her grandfather, I'm sorry. And where did this land situate? Where was it located? Between Iowa Falls and Eldora, okay. Iowa. And this was in the vicinity where you live? Correct. Okay. When they, you said that they would come out Put the crop in, come back, take the crop out. Correct. Would you have contact with them on either one of those occasions? Sure. Yeah. Any, any recollection of any concern that, that, or concern that Todd shared with you about his life with Amy, the kids or anything like that? You'll have to rephrase that. I'm not sure what you're asking. Uh, it was not a good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one of those encounters that, that, when they would be there for farming purposes only, not family gatherings or anything. Did you ever have any personal conversations with Todd then about family issues? No. Okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. That's all I have. <laughs> that was not a good question. Not a good question. <laughs> I mean, okay. We all knew it was not a good question. It wasn't phrased very well. Good night, Lupe. Thanks for, for coming, babe. Good to see you as always. <clears throat> she don't admit that. Can you imagine if that were me and she said, you'll have to rephrase, I don't understand that? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's like, yeah, that's not a good question. I would have been like, your honor, can I use the crayons? <laughs> <laughs> I just realized in your, in your thumbnail, you have his little eyebrow move that he does. I do. You I totally do. captured it. I did. I'm slick. <laughs> yeah, you are. That's his tell. It's like, it's almost when he does that face, he's just like, these people are full of shit. Right. Right. I mean, I'm going, I'm going to prison forever because these assholes are lying. Correct. I'm going to prison because I asked my mother-in-law once four score and seven years ago, she knew what my wife had done and <laughs> she spilled the tea. Yes. All the tea. All she had to do was say yes. She knew. Exactly. It's all the not confirmation I say, need. Not only did she say that, she also said, I think you should reach out to the wife. <laughs> what kind of friend and mother-in-law are you? Is she? I'm wondering if she's more friends with Todd. It seems like it. Well, see, that's what's weird is that they, okay, so it started out where she was friends with Amy first, right? And even though Todd and, and Amy were dating at the time or together at the time, it wasn't immediately that she met Todd. It wasn't for, as she put it, a while. So right. then what, all of a sudden they became friends? Like, I'm so Once again, confused. why did the defense ask these kinds of questions? Like, so, you know, was this common? Did you and Todd have this type of relationship where you talked to each other about, you know, your marital status and, and marital woes? Like, Where's where's any foundation in this relationship that this this testimony makes any flipping sense? Yes. You know what defense attorneys should do? They really ought to peruse the YouTubes for the true crime community and listen in on discussions like this and perhaps invite people like us to <laughs> review the evidence and say what we think so they'll know how to ask the questions. Well, yeah, I feel like these people have been so stuck in a courtroom that they have forgotten what, like, human beings act like. Correct. And this is even before the pandemic. So the, they were stuck in a courtroom, but not on quarantine. Like, I've completely right. ha forgotten how to act ha with, like, social graces and stuff like that because I was locked in the lockdown for a minute, right? Right. Not really. That's not true. I hardly left my house any to begin with. I actually like the, 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 the mask <laughs> thing and people just social distancing. I'm all for it. It's right up my alley. That's right. I don't like, talk to you either. Stay away. For years. Correct. I don't really dig. I, I'm not a fan of people. You just stay six feet over there. And I'll tell you what. Back up an extra foot for good measure. In 10 years, you're going to be like, you need to step away. You've probably right. got the, the corona. Let's just go over there. <laughs> I'm just, I, know that, I know that dadgum uh, 
CDC says six feet. Let's be let's be extra safe. Back up for, to seven. How about you all just stay home while I have to go do my errands? Correct. Jen Lu is going to the store. Clear out. <laughs> I want. I all would the, love that. I would too. I want the targets to myself. And oh, by the way, I don't like the music you're playing. Target. Here is my requests. Here's my requests. <laughs> I think you have to be like J Lo to be able to put that kind of stuff in. <laughs> J. Lou, close enough, <laughs> which is why I'm shopping at Target myself and not sending my people out to do it. <laughs> I would be really sad if I was a star, though, and I couldn't shop at Target. I'm just going to say that because I enjoy my Target time. Yes. It's important. I, I, I don't know. Like when they locked us down, I don't really like to go out anyways, but then all of a sudden I wanted to go because I couldn't go. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember the old Mervin's commercial where you're like at the they're at the door yes. and they're like open, 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 open? open. open. <laughs> I miss Mervin's. I wish they'd bring uh, those back. I miss Mervin's commercials. That commercial was good. Shall pressed up against the glass. <laughs> open, 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 open. <laughs> oh boy. All right. So are we doing are we still gonna do Tristan's or are we waiting for that one? What do you think? Because his is what? Let me look at this. Uh, his is I like an hour two and a half. Three people. We can do it tomorrow if you want. Yeah, let's do Tristan's tomorrow. Because all his is long. Enough. And then we can start early. And I know that um, the uh, people uh, want to know how uh, see pictures of the farm and stuff like that. And I do. We do have those. You know, Shamita does. Shamita oh, yeah. her 11 billion <clears throat> pictures. She's done. Got them all. So we're going to show, I'll show those and we'll go over Tristan's testimony. Cause I think that's important. And I want to be, too. I don't want us to, I don't want to put him on uh double speed or anything like that because I, I think agree. people need to hear it. And I think they need to hear the emotion. So and, yes. and the multiple and, steps of his, his uh, interviews as they progress throughout time. Correct. Agreed. 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 Yeah. And they talk about, they enter ex exhibits, but they don't show them about the buildings and everything. So the pictures will help. Yeah, they don't show them. They don't show them during the trial, huh? I think I had to look them all up separate. Uh, I don't know, but I know they don't show them during Tristan's because he's on the video monitor, so we don't okay. even see him. Right, which makes sense. I know. Right. I will say this: I was a little taken aback. When the, again, for emphasis, assistant attorney general had to be reminded of the procedure before you publish uh, an exhibit, meaning show it, you have to enter it and it has to be received by the court. And then you, they have, you have to ask and then the judge will, ask, then the defense will say no objection or if they object and then They'll say, okay, it's admitted into evidence or it's not. Then you ask if you can publish it. Not, hey, let me just show you this picture. You're not talking to me at the 7-Eleven. Hey, let me, let me show you this picture. Let me show you this meme I got the other day. It's hilarious. Okay. <laughs> hey, check out this I guess meme. I, you know what? I, one thing I, I have to – the attorney general <clears> – <throat> How I thought they did a lot of civil cases, and I'm just wondering if that's like a state thing or how that works out for state. And I don't remember looking into that. Um, okay, I don't know how they do it in Iowa. And the only time, the only thing that is not, I'm so I don't even want to hear myself say this, but it's fixing to come out of my mouth. So when the West Memphis three were going through their appeals process, okay, um. The assistant attorney general is the one that you guys all saw uh, test of uh, giving his um, he was addressing the um, Arkansas State Supreme Court. He was also included towards the end um, before they were um, before they did the um, Alfred plea. He was included on a lot of the answers so the defense would file something, right? And then the court would, uh, then the um, the prosecutor would give their response, okay? And he was included in a lot of that, almost almost all of it. So I, th I think 
that the way it goes is that I know that attorney generals are the ones that can argue in front of the state Supreme Court. But I don't know how that I'm going to I'll look that up tomorrow. Because All right. I that's think, the homework assignment for everybody. Yes. We're fine. Figure out why an assistant attorney general is prosecuting this case. And is yes. it such an Iowa thing or is there a specific reason? Because I don't know if any of us actually know the answer. Right. Because <clears throat> does Iowa have the death penalty. Mm. Let me get let me hit up the, these Google A's right quick. Whoa. Almost dropped my own phone. All right. Hold on. Maybe it's a maybe they uh, do it when there is. It was abolished in 1965. So no, because it's definitely not 1964. So okay, I'm, I was thinking, well, maybe if it's a capital offense, but it's not if there's no death penalty. I'm. Let's all. That's going to be our homework assignment, everybody. You guys all look. I'll look it up too, and we'll meet back here uh, tomorrow night uh, earlier. Let's. We're going to start at eight. Because Tristan's uh, testimony is important, but it's also long. And obviously, we need to discuss in between. We can't just sit here for an hour and a half. Yeah, no. Yeah. Even if we wanted to, we wouldn't be able to. It's just no, I can't keep my mouth shut that long. Me either. I'm always like, where's the pause? Where's the pause? Which is why I liked it when Shmita was uploading them, uh, sharing it that way. Because not that I'm not grateful to Mo. Mo did an excellent job. We have all of this today because Mo did such a great job. But I forgot that when you share through YouTube, meaning you're sharing a YouTube channel's content, which it's most, um, the other people can't push pause. Oh. So, yeah. So when we were doing it before, the reason that Shmita could push pause is because she chose not to share her screen, but to share a video file. That's why. And I didn't think about okay. that. Yeah. So, but Mo, I am eternally grateful because we needed that. And some of the footage was really choppy and this, this was really seamless and smooth. And I really appreciate that. So, um, I think, yeah, I think we should definitely talk about Tristan tomorrow and then come back and, uh, figure out why the, uh, assistant attorney general is prosecuting this case. Okay. It seems like an overreach. That's why I'm wondering if it's something to do with like per state. Yeah. Oh, Shmita said it worked out today, though, because you can't speed hers up. So we, oh, we'll, yeah. we'll have to remember to make sure you do it this way for closing. <laughs> yes, 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 for sure. For sure, because that's, whew, that was a lot. Did you did you come in last night? And no. Watch, oh, yeah. You got to watch the replay. Watch us on two speed, but you got to watch it because there's an excellent video montage towards the end. Okay. Uh, all yeah, the yeah, Watts that. Island memes, <laughs> and they are so hilarious. Okay, I'll watch it. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I've stayed far away from that island. Well, look, I have too, and I never thought I would return. I haven't um, even watched the new documentary. Uh, let me save you. Well, some you're trouble. not missing anything. Okay, good. Yeah, you didn't miss anything, and that's really what we talked about last night. Is that um, the 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 selling point? for the documentary was going to be the social media aspect of the case. That was a whole lie. All they really did was critique Shanann for being in basically an overshare on social media, failing to recognize that because she shared so much on social media, it was why the alarm bells were sent off for Nicole Atkinson so quickly because the girls would were supposed to start school that day and her timeline wasn't flooded with pictures of the girls at school plus all the times that she'd try to reach out to her and they failed to mention that and that kind of annoyed me because they were very critical of Shanann and also they didn't go into like the reason that she um posted so much it wasn't to boost just to boost her sales right for lavelle and thrive it was because it's required by lavelle and thrive and they didn't mention that well did they mention that she posted lots of the kids because she had no family near her they did but it's the way that they did it teresa it was like a backhanded dig they would, they would, they would, it was like, you know how, it was like a compliment sandwich. So they would say something nice about Shanann. Like she also had family that didn't live very close to her. 
And then they would follow that up with, for some reason, she just had this need to share everything. It boosted her sales. <laughs> like that's how they, that's how they packaged it. And it was, I don't, I, it, I, I'm sure there is a, a, a small portion of it that's due to editing. Okay. But um, I just found them to be very critical of Shanann. And, but if you're going to talk about the social media aspect of it, why are we going through the entire timeline of the crime? 55 hours missing, 42 hours missing. It, it was nothing more really than a rehashing of the events that took place between the time that the girl, that Shanann and the girls are reported missing until Chris Watts confessed. And then a little bit of the, they talked a little bit about the visit that uh, Tammy Lee and her pal, was it Bumhauer? No, not Bumhauer. What is it? Uh, Kobach? When they went back to Colorado or uh, went visit him in the prison. Mm -hmm. Okay. They, they mentioned that like a blurb. It, it just, they didn't, it was nothing more really than a retelling of the case with different experts to talk. They had like 37 psychologists. God, I feel like I've, I've seen so many experts. There's so many Watts experts. Well, Everybody's a Watts one expert. Girl that was a, did a podcast and she only did three episodes on the Watts and she has a YouTube with 400 subs. So I don't know how they found her or picked her. Maybe she knows somebody. Or else they looked on it. Yeah, but maybe, well, just because she they wanted, wanted some, somebody with no drama. <laughs> maybe her, well, that too, but maybe her podcast, they didn't even look at YouTube. Maybe she has a podcast podcast that's carried on like um, Stitcher or something like that. And that's how they found her. And she has a bigger audience there than she does on YouTube. Well, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I'd never heard of her. I looked her up because you know how much it bugged me. <laughs> yeah, She's I know. a pretty girl, though. She is pretty. And she, she, she had a lot of knowledge on the case. But, you know. Oh, Shanann's teacher was uh on there too uh what's his name um matt or, francis or, oh yeah the one that she would like hang out with well they didn't mention that part but yeah oh. they left that part just and it, nate's mom was on there a lot yeah nate's mom was nate's on there. mom yeah vonda yeah. was on there i didn't mm -hmm. know she wrote a book mm -hmm. she did she did she Maxie, did. didn't Maxie interview her yeah and i think he went to the house a couple times mm -hmm. yeah did any, was there any family or family friends? No. No. Which I'm not, I'm just going to say this. I was led to believe, I'm not going to reveal by who, Shmita, that um, there was a family <laughs> friend that was going to be featured. And I got all the way to like, there's only two minutes left in the documentary. I pushed pause. I hit up the, the Shmitas. I said, Shmita, are you sure? And then she comes back and she's like, oh, I thought she was, but I just went through it and she's not. <laughs> well, see, I thought so too. That's why I, was so I didn't ask again because I was like, I don't know who this person is, but well, it's I know exactly. Avocado. Yeah, it's an, no, I knew exactly who it was. So um, I was looking for her. And then I was like, Shamina, are you sure? And she said, Oops, my bad. Same well, old I, I, I thought somebody made an appearance in there too, but apparently they didn't. No, they did not. <laughs> They did not. I thought they were going to as well. But nope. Nope, nope, nope. The only Same person man. the only person they had that actually, besides uh Matt Francis, was um another girl that followed Shanann on social media. Oh gosh, what was her name? Like Jessica something. She wasn't oh, familiar no. to me. I kept she, zoning out because I'd already seen it all before. Right. Yeah. That was the point. I think that that's why I was let down because let's be, be honest. Tubi is a rather obscure streaming service. Not a whole lot of people know about it. So the people that would have watched that documentary are people that were already familiar with the case. So why not take advantage of that fact? And of course, obviously you need to lay down 
some foundation just for the people that have never that don't know anything about the case. But let's be honest, there's 11 billion other documentaries if you feel like you want more information. Or you can and, simply just uh, go on the go on the YouTubes. Correct. Right. That too. Right. Watch Dr. B. She covers it all. Yeah. So, uh, absolutely. <laughs> the so, police that came to Lana's house didn't even know who Chris Watts was. Oh my gosh, that that is ridiculous to me. But yeah, I didn't mean to bring that up. But <laughs> I just caught I caught that, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh Yeah, no, Tony, that Jessica girl, I don't think she did either. She just her I think her official description in the documentary was followed Shanann's social media. And um so yeah, it was really I felt like they they it was a missed opportunity to tell a, to 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 talk about a, a part of the case that really hasn't been spoken about, but Doctor B and I never fear. We're gonna. I, I think Doctor B and I are gonna end up doing an, a documentary. And let me just say, it's probably gonna be a nine-hour documentary because we never know what to leave out, so we leave nothing out. So you're gonna have to watch it in stages. Are you doing like a full-on Watts documentary? Or are you I, talking about just doing like or, about these shows that have come on? I th I think that um, we've talked about this before, but because it's never been really fully explored, I think doing something about the social media aspect on it would be good. The after effect or the during effect? Both. I agree. That's why it's nine hours. <laughs> right. <laughs> But and BR the star, I totally agree. Like all the people that came out after Netflix. Yeah. I feel like uh I feel like that's a compelling portion of the story. Not just social media, but as it as it pertains to the Watts case, but media in general as it pertains to cases from the very beginning up until and even during trial there's oh, one God, could you imagine when the summer wells case goes to trial oh, oh gosh can you imagine the potential for certain witnesses to be on the stand oh gosh yeah i mean i just yeah. it's an it's such a social media mess oh, and i feel like it was cultivated it by the watts case ironically Yes, but do I you agree. think it'll ever go to trial? I mean, yeah, of course it will. I think at some point, I think at some point something's going to come out about it. And I don't, I just, I mean, who's going to be, you know, who's going to be the defendant slash defendants? I, I have no idea at this point, but yeah, me either. I just, <laughs> just like what, what has happened to the case itself throughout social media and the, the tip lines with, you know, TBI, it's, a, 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 oh. Correct, because yeah, he, yeah we will like, definitely cover that. This YouTuber shows up at this property at this time, and then this YouTuber calls TBI at this time, and then this YouTuber. Well, right, but not only that, what about the things that um, the Wells told YouTubers? Oh, yeah. No, I know. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah. it's, they're gonna, it's all going to come out. You Actually, what I that's mean? when I started watching you, Teresa. Is it really? Yes, Aww. and I'm in love with you. Well, Aww. not that way. You know what I mean. That's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm good with that. It makes me feel all blessed. I came in the chat and I was like, I love this Teresa girl. I've been telling her. I've been like, <laughs> Teresa is just a, a blonde-haired <clears throat> version of me. <laughs> but, but it's so not... weird because I actually, I suffer from like major anxiety and getting on these panels, like as much as people think it's like seamless, dude, I it makes me nervous. I can't it, every single day. Okay. So I'm better now than I was, but I'm always nervous every time. Every and time. when, um, I cover when Dr. B and I, anytime we talk about Kurt Cobain, every single time, right before about 30 minutes before we're supposed to go live, I get the worst indigestion of my life every single time. 
which doesn't really have anything to do with nervousness. I think it, I don't know what that's about, but I, I get nervous Probably every sing, every single time I click go live. Yeah, I don't know. It's like, there's such a weird thing, but like once you're on, because like Jen, for you, nobody would ever know that. Nobody would ever think that, you, or that you're nervous about it. I wouldn't it's think you were either. I would, yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> think you were either. I'm just but, act every time. Every well, time, especially when I had like people, when I had like people on that I was like talking to, like not just like how we're talking to each other. And this is much easier, but the, the fine line of trying to figure out, like, because I'm not a by no means do I, I don't have any journalism background whatsoever. So, the the respect, the not probing too much, but still trying to get information, but not being an asshole, and and there's so much like that you're is running through your head. It's like. You have so many questions, but you're like, am I like even allowed to say this? Should I ask that? I yeah. I think I think you do excellent. I agree. I think you did and an I excellent. I can't wait job. for your channel to get. Me too, but I'll tell you what, uh, Teresa. What I like about the way you handle interviews is, I like the way that you ask the question, and you let and you, then you listen, and base your follow up questions on the response that you get. I, it's very, it's yes. difficult to conduct an interview when you're so, um, cause this is a hard thing to do. Interviews are not easy when you're focused on the questions that you want to ask and making sure that you ask the questions. It's difficult not to, uh, rem it's difficult to not forget to be listening to the answer. And if you listen to the answer and you ask the questions I would ask, you did a great, you've done a fabulous job. You really oh, I appreciate have it. that. Thank you. Because oh. interviewing is not easy. No, it's, and that's even more nerve wracking. That's what I'm saying. Like, no, uh -uh. get all stomach right. cramps and I'm like sweating and <laughs> oh man. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely not easy. Well, you hide just... it well. Yeah, you do hide it well. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I mean, I was in the wrong industry. I should have been an actor or something. I probably would have been nervous. <laughs> yeah. you got... I, the other thing is, it's like, I never, I didn't prep for any of those interviews. Like I never, oh, wow. I never wrote questions down or anything like that. Okay? It was all just willy nilly. That's the best. Those are the best kind of interviews because <laughs> I think that. <clears throat> yeah, because well, you're a good listener. Like, on where I wanted the conversation to go. I just wanted to be able to talk to them and get the information and share it. So I, I didn't have specific questions to try to lead anything anywhere. I just wanted what they had to say, like open, you know what I mean? Yeah. You made it feel less <clears throat> of a, like an interview and more like a conversation, which is good, especially if you're trying to get information out of somebody, right? You want to hear what they have to say, but if they're feeling like it's an interview, then they're going to be tense and less likely to speak freely. But the way that you handled it was excellent because you did put your guest at ease and you did get her to talk. And there was information that she shared that, started the ball rolling on some things on things we didn't what should i say i shouldn't put it like that she, she said some things that was were new information and because you had her at ease it was easier to tell from a, a viewer's perspective whether or not her story was genuine and that's difficult to do. Look at Barbara Walter. She's been doing it for 11 billion years and she still makes people tense. She's good at it too, but you know what I'm saying? You did a really good job. I appreciate that. I really do. And I hopefully, hopefully as uh, time goes on and the channel is able to grow and, you know, cause I think first, you know, typically people aren't going to want to try to tell their story on a channel that has, you know, 900 subs. So, um, you know, hopefully we can get there. And I, you know, I've always, I'm always just about the story itself. Like that's what I, I think that's the part that intrigues me because I don't, especially with Summer Wells, I never had like a preconceived notion of what I actually thought happened. I was very open to so many possibilities at that time. That I think that's probably why I didn't have any like intent on where I needed the conversation to go because I had zero idea what I really believed happened. Yeah. Well, if you think about it in the very, at the very beginning, we really didn't know all that much about what happened. We just knew some really basic facts. We knew how old she was, the general, you know, the, the kind of area that they lived in, um, that there was, she seemed to have vanished out of, out of thin air. There mm -hmm. wasn't, you know what I'm saying? And I feel like <sighs> it's very tricky. And this is why I tend to stay away from 
cases that are open and currently being investigated because it's a very fine line between getting out the information with respect to a case and unintentionally inserting yes. yourself into the case without yep. even meaning to because you you've asked a question right that you had that is an innocuous question but what but the question that <laughs> but the answer received can sometimes lead somewhere and then boom before you know it it's you know it snowballs I mean, luckily i never got that that far into it i would, <laughs> I would yeah. love for you to interview cat chazzle dazzles girlfriend oh my gosh jen lou would be good at that one she'd get her to crack because i still think that she knew i think she knew all that shit was a lie I think, I think so she knew too. everything was a lie. I think she knew that he didn't have a job, that he wasn't in school, that he was lying about all of it. I think she knew all of that. And I, I think, think she, she knew more I don't think she knew she... he was going to kill his parents, but I think that she knew that he was living a life of all lies matter. Exactly. Because I... oh, is... both of y'all would be so good at that. Thank you. I think, <laughs> Allie, I. <laughs> Shmita I... Finder. <laughs> yeah, Shmita. Get her. Um, yeah, go I get think, her, See, I think with Kat, this is where I, there's some red flags to, for me because I have a daughter that's roughly her. In fact, she is her age. Um, there is a, 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 a um, bit of naiveness because of her age. However, I don't know any 23-year-old that Googles $650,000 homes. And thinks that's a realistic expectation. And I just, I, I couldn't, I don't know if both of them are living in some weird fantasy and they just hoped everything would work out. I, I don't I know, do. you know, because it's, there's a, there are parts of her uh, personality and her story where she seemed like she side-eyed the mess out of that fool and she checked up on him on the regular, hence the social, the, the, uh, Synapity chats location being turned on both. But I think that's because she knew he was a liar. Exactly. And exactly. he also, I think cheated on her. Yeah. Before. Well, I know that was on Reddit, but it's weird. Cause I would, I, I don't know. Yeah. But what's her name? They overlapped the other girlfriend. Well, there's 12 months in a year, babe. So they only gave the year they were dating. You know what I mean? It's possible that she started dating him like they were back to back. Or maybe they did overlap by a couple of weeks. But I don't I don't know if that means cheating. Uh, Chazzle Dazzle doesn't seem like the type of man that or boy or kid that could juggle one woman, let alone <laughs> two. Like well, he juggled, he juggled, all juggled jobs and school and all kinds <laughs> right? of stuff. Yeah, but a woman is different. He's not good with people. <clears throat> and the fact of the matter is he had the house to himself all weekend long. And where does he put the girlfriend night one? In the dadgum couch fort. <laughs> I rest my case, Your Honor. <laughs> you should show the meme I made. Which one? You should. <laughs> I don't always bedazzle. Oh, I didn't save that. You had it. You'll have. Do you have it on your on your computer? If you find it in your images and and choose to share it, your screen, I'll share it. I'll prove it so people can see it because I don't have it on my on my uh, computer. I didn't save it. I just feel like uh, there are set, there are a few people uh, with in cases that we've covered over the years or that I've been interested in that I would just like, like, I'll give you a prime example, Chris McDonough. I only want to ask Chris McDonough one question because Ooh. he did interview two suspects from the West Memphis three case. I just want to ask him one question and that's it. It's not even well, a whole question. I can't, I can't figure out how to get a hold of him. Seriously? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Because that's all I want to do. Just the, I have one question that I want to ask him. And I don't even know. I won't even make it public. It's for my own knowledge. And if he's comfortable, maybe we can do. Maybe I can make it public at some point. But it's just for my own knowledge. It's just something I want to know. And he's the only person that can answer it. 
Nobody else can. Well, how interesting that you have a question about the West Memphis Three and he's the one that can answer it and he's on YouTube. Correct. It's like almost like the fates have a line. Chris McDonough, if you're out there and you can hear me, call me. <laughs> call me. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I I just uh I just wanna I just want I just wanna um I just, I, there's just one question and it's an important question and I just want it. That's it. I just want to answer. Yeah. I, I tried. I, I went to the Twitters. I went all over. I went to the Twitters. I went to his YouTube. He doesn't have any, uh, anything on his about sections or anything for you to contact or for me to contact him. But yeah, that's just, I just, there's just one question I want to ask him and it's not even a hard one. Okay, I'll have to pull up some thing and see if I can find it then. Because I thought that he, maybe because of all the people coming at him, that he took all that stuff down. I don't know. That, does he not still have a Twitter? So he does have a Twitter. But, you know, what's interesting about the Twitter is after all that stuff happened, he made it where you can request to follow him and he will either approve you or not approve you. He's got his Twitter uh, set to private, which I don't blame him. He had, a, there was a lot of, you know. Yeah, there was a lot of weird stuff going on at that time. Thank you, Amelia, or BR the star. I absolutely will look on his website. So, yeah. Um, there's, there's, there's a few people and it's not even that many. It's like uh, five, there's like five people in all the cases that I've ever been interested or looked at over the years that I, that I want to speak to. That's it. Just five. Hmm. And Chris and, and Chris McDonough is one of them. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, he's the only one that can answer this question and that's why it's so important. I, I have seen him be asked about the West Memphis three elsewhere, but does he respond to the questions or no? No, not real. Okay, so basically, um, <clears throat> he he will he to my knowledge from what what I've seen, he's never uh, come out and said whether or not he believes the West Memphis three are innocent or guilty, and that's not even the question I want to ask ask him. But he does tend to not acknowledge that question. Well, you just got a message that somebody has his email, so maybe you can email. Ali seventy nine said he took his Twitter down. Oh, did he? I mean, I, yeah, see, I don't keep up. I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm not a good tweeter. <laughs> I'm not a good Instagrammer. I'm not good at any of that stuff. It's just not my, yeah, it's not put, me. Either. I don't put a bunch of, and I don't even, I don't even post a lot on like my Facebook page, like my me actual, either. like my profile. Like, I think my kids get like their school pictures put up for the family and then uh, maybe a Christmas one and then maybe something in the summer. <laughs> People. I'm the same way. I think I've posted once in like a year and a half. Yeah, I don't. I'm not good at it. I just don't. I don't care to do it. I'm not. I'm an undersharer instead of an oversharer. See, I agree. I, I'm like that too. Mostly because I feel like, <sighs> who the hell cares what I ate for dinner last night? I don't even care what I ate for dinner well, last I, night. I really you know what I mean? When the people are posting the food and the food looks so damn good and I can't eat it. Yes. That pisses also, me off, actually. Also, I'm like, why are you doing that? Like, are you, I, I want that food, and now you're making it so I can't have it. Correct. It's just rude. And it also, it's freaking rude. also, if you're going to be posting pictures from you at the gym, or a video of you at the gym. Yeah, don't rub that shit in. I'm tired. I don't want to see that shit unless you <laughs> fell off the treadmill, landed halfway across the gym, okay? Yes. Keep it to yourself. Record that shit. Record that Yeah, shit. record that crap. If you Look, I'll, I'll be supportive of that. And a five-minute mile. That's it. That's it. A five-minute mile. <laughs> I'd be dead. <laughs> a five-minute five mile is like five minutes. Too. <laughs> five, minutes is in, five minutes is supposed to be five. Between five and six is like the ideal time for a mile. Yeah. <laughs> not not a, not a my age after. Me neither. Well, I, after I think in high school I did it in eleven minutes. <laughs> I used to be able to, when I was in high school, I could do a five minute mile. Um, Did you really? Yeah, because. Uh, never never ran. Ran. Well, because uh, my dad used to run marathons 
And so I would train with him and I, but I didn't all the time run. I went on his like short runs, the three mile runs with him. And then yeah, also I, short run. Yeah. Well, compared You're lucky to, if I'm going to run to the, like run up the stairs. Like that's, that's about, and then I'm like, <laughs> well, now I, don't I wouldn't to... run if somebody was chasing me with a knife. I'd just lay down and be like, well, go ahead. Cause I just I'm, dead. I'm dead. You already <laughs> not. <laughs> Look, I can either die by the knife or I can die. Of, I can collapse from not being able to breathe because yeah. I'm trying to run. Either no, way, you're going to give me too much anxiety. I don't need to do that shit. Do it now. Either, exactly. Like, either way, what, just call me and I'll just drive there and we'll just meet. Like it'll be way easier. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Let's just cut. Let's just let's just cut to the chase, as it were. No pun intended. And go ahead, because all this is going to do is just exhaust us both. And I don't want my dad ran marathons me. too, Heather. Yeah, so I used to uh, train with my dad, but I also played soccer. And um, they used to make us every day before practice. We had to run around the school, not even on the track, because oh, obviously God, you I'm run. Tired hearing about it. You will you run more oh, yeah. in I... practice than you ever do in a game? It's so that you don't get tired in a game. Right. Oh yeah. Well, back in the day, I could run a lot. Now I'm just like, damn, I'm tired. Oh, no, I couldn't do a five-minute mile. I think at my peak, uh, when I was like, I know I was not, I think I was right, was the year 39, I was 39, I wasn't 40 yet. <laughs> I could run like a nine or eight to nine-minute mile, and that's it. So silly. I walk up the stairs, and you think, you think I'd run five miles. This conversation makes me tired. I've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm just like, I don't even want to run to the bathroom. Like, I don't want to do any of that crap. But I used to be able to do it. I just don't want to do it anymore. It's not. It's not like it, I don't know. I don't. I just don't have the motivation. Maybe I'll get back there. I got a treadmill. I should get back on it. But oh, well, she wasn't joking. She wasn't. She said, <laughs> she said "Out." Y'all are making me tired. I'm out. I got to go. <laughs> All right. Well, I didn't get to thank her. Hopefully, she's listening. Thank you, Teresa, for coming up. I can't wait to uh, cover this more uh, tomorrow night. We're gonna go again earlier we're going to start at eight eastern thank you for everybody for coming thank you for listening there she is she probably just put back I'm laughing so hard that amy's coming that i i accidentally hit the button and i laughed <laughs> <laughs> oh, amy's funny oh, yeah, she's gonna leave and i'm like i guess i'm out <laughs> no, I was like, well, she wasn't joking. She was like, Y'all are making me tired. I'm leaving. I was like, whoa. Yeah, when she says she's out, she's out. She ain't joking around. I don't say goodnight to anybody. Nothing. I'm done. No. <laughs> Teresa out. Jen runs. I'm oh, out of here. That made me cry a little. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we get enough exercise uh, just laughing. That's burns. That burns calories. I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, I should have like a six pack for sure. I yeah. don't. So I need some more laughter in my life. <laughs> well, listen, you come hang out with us anytime. Go, watch every those, time. go watch those Chris Watts memes and you will be laughing. Yeah, you okay, will. Okay, I'll go watch that. You will. You will definitely uh, well, thank laugh. Thank you guys so much for, uh, for doing this case because I am, I am excited that you guys were ex interested in it. Oh, I'm oh, very. Yes. You are yeah, so it's welcome. been killing me. Yeah, I, Mo, know, Mo I want to talk about it and I can't. <laughs> Mo is about to burst. She's about we haven't to even got to the good stuff yet. No, oh, I gosh. know the nine one one call. I can't. If wait. you say anything, I already know about it because that's I, all I'm saying. Okay, I don't want to know any more than that. Please. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm gonna head out and pick up the little from uh, gymnastics. So, but uh, all right, I'll, thank you I'll so be much. tomorrow, and we can talk about this soon. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, this time I'm off, and so I'm gonna say goodbye and say thank you to everybody. <laughs> Good night, babe. Thank you for coming. It's of always course. a pleasure. Um, so Molson, man, we didn't we only covered today. You didn't miss very much. We covered um the <coughs> opening statements. Um, and then we covered uh the victim's brother and the victim's um stepmother. Tomorrow we're gonna cover her son. And that's the one you really want to uh, stick around for. And you're always welcome. And so glad you came 
to hang out with us, all of you guys. It's so nice to see you guys returning and being interested. And it just, you know, it just melts the my cold black heart when I see this kind of stuff. Makes me so happy. So. I, I would, agree. I love seeing all the regulars come in and the new people. Yes. It's just exciting for you. Well, thank you. It's a, I love it. I know you I love do. it. So um, I'm going to say thank you, Mo, for all of your hard work putting You're together welcome. the testimony today. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody in chat. Thank you for the super chats. And I will see everyone tomorrow at 8 Eastern. Good night. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.